Okay. Come on. I can't talk. If I don't turn that off, something will happen. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you as we uh, move along towards two weeks before Christmas, a uh, great month of celebration. Let's stand up together. The only name we serve, right? Here we go. <laughs> Father, 
we bow to give you thanks, Lord. We're so blessed. And as we come into this Christmas season, Lord, prepare our hearts, open our hearts to remember your name, to remember Jesus coming to earth to give us, to show us the way and give us a chance of salvation, Lord. We, we ask that we be a light for you and, and remember the real reason for this season, Lord. For it is in Jesus' name that we proclaim. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 devotion, just a time to reflect, reflect on what the season is, and to kind of close out our service with Silent Night as we worship the fact that God became a man for us. And that's a joyous occasion, right? So joy to the world. Let's, let's finish this part with joy to the world as we prepare for communion. <laughs>
This is a season when we are thinking of and celebrating the birth of Jesus. We are looking forward to this joyous occasion. Mary, a young virgin, would soon be giving birth to Jesus, the Son of Man and God. She had been visited by the angel Gabriel who gave her greetings. Luke 1, 28 through 33. Coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Consider the joy of Joseph and Mary upon arrival of their son into the world. Imagine all the wonderful moments of watching Jesus take his first step and all the other firsts in his life. Mary had been promised Jesus would ascend to the throne of David one day, so she would not expect God's plan to allow Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice. She was aware of his teachings and the crowd of followers he was acquiring. He appeared, appeared to be gaining recognition by influential and non-influential alike, something you might expect of one who would ascend to the throne. Passover was at hand. Jesus knew it was time to do what his heavenly father sent him to do. He would allow himself to become the perfect sacrifice. He would be mocked, scourged, pierced, and hung on a cross. Before all of this had transpired, Jesus shared a special Passover meal with his 12 disciples. During this meal, Jesus set up a memorial them all of us share remember his death burial and resurrection mark 14 20 through 25 while they were eating he took some bread and after blessing broke it and gave it to them and said take it this is my body and when he had taken a cup and given thanks he gave it to them and they all drank from it and he said to them this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink a new, it new in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to always remember <coughs> that uh, you were willing to send your son to be the perfect lamb of God, the sacrifice that would free us from our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing yourself to be this perfect sacrifice. And may we always remember what you did by your death, burial, and resurrection. I pray this in our Lord's holy and precious name. Amen. Savior has been born, the one we've waited for, surrounded by our praises. He is here, the promise.
Stand together, please. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining apart from shadows dim, giving in light for those who long and go, and guiding the wise men on their way up to the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star. Would you pray with me? Our precious Heavenly Father, we turn our eyes, our hearts, 
back towards that first Christmas day this morning. And remember how you loved heaven's glory to come to earth, to live among us so that you could lay down your life on Calvary's cross for each of us. And so we just ask you to fill this place with your spirit today. Father, may everything we do glorify you and lift you up because it's you that is the reason for the season. Were it not for Jesus and the hope that he gives us today, there would be no reason for celebration. But Father, because of Jesus, may we celebrate every day the forgiveness and hope an eternal life we have to look forward to one day. Now, Father, we just ask for those that aren't with us this morning that you might reach out and touch them and comfort them, whether it be because of travel or sickness. Watch over them and bring them safely back to us again. And Father, may all we say and do today bring glory to the name of Jesus. For it's in that precious name we pray. The kids are dismissed to junior church right now. Wow, been an exciting few days, hasn't it? I got here yesterday morning and turned my computer on to work on uh, the message a little bit for today and, and came across some reports from Western Kentucky that just looked horrible. And it reminded me again that In this season of great joy, it can also be a time of great pain. That there are conflicts that take place at Christmas time. It's sometimes not exactly what we anticipate it to be. It's supposed to be a time of peace and joy. Sometimes it becomes a time of pain and conflict and disillusionment. In fact, one expert said, the Christmas season is marked with a greater emotional stress and more acts of violence than any other time of the year. You bring somebody home for the holidays to meet the family for the first time, and you're excited, but it turns into one of those parental nightmares as mom and dad just don't like the person you brought home. Or you get married, and and you're excited because you're celebrating your first Christmas together, but parents are both sides are upset because you're not spending Christmas morning at their house. You invite all your relatives to come over for Christmas dinner, and you imagine a time of laughter and warmth, but instead, sometimes there are harsh words and hurt feelings, and you end up disappointed. There are all kinds of things that happen during the holidays that can turn joy into sorrow and peace into conflict. But but when those times come, would, would you do me a favor? Remember, it's nothing new. That, that Mary and Joseph had difficulties preparing for that first Christmas. Do you remember? If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Luke again this morning. We're going to start in Luke chapter 1 as we look at the birth again of the baby Jesus. And there's rejoicing and anticipation, but, but along with it, there's heartache and disappointment during that first Christmas. So, so what I'm hoping is that as we look at these scriptures today, you can remind it that no matter what you're going through right now, No matter what your disillusionment may be, you can still find joy in the Christmas season. It it all begins with Mary's joyful experience. In in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26, we read, (coughs) In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a a town in Galilee. Now, now you understand that Galilee is kind of the, the back woods area of Judea. To to us today, it would be like saying that God sent an angel to a small town in the Appalachian Mountains of eastern Kentucky. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. I I, I love the way that uh, the 
the Living Bible paraphrases this because it, it kind of puts it in our mind. He said, congratulations. The Lord had something special for you. Mary was greatly troubled by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you're to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since, since I'm a virgin? You know, one of the, 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 the things that we debate most over the Christmas season and, and that people argue about is, is, is the virgin birth. I mean, how can you really believe in a virgin birth? Isn't it nice to know that the very first person who ever doubted the virgin birth was Mary? How could this happen to me? And the angel answered, the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born to you will be called the, the Son of God. You know, one of the things we learn very quickly in the Bible is, you go back to Genesis, and, and God was the only one that created. No, nobody else created in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God formed the first man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living being. And it was God that created the first man and nobody else, and it was God who created Jesus. There was nobody else involved in his creation. He was the son of God. In verses 36 and 37, it says, Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Can we all say that last line together? Nothing is impossible with God. One more time. Nothing is impossible with God. If you believe that in the beginning God created this universe and everything that's around us today from nothing, then you know nothing's impossible for him. And a miracle is just an act of God that's contrary to the laws of nature as we understand them. But God has the ability to do that anytime he chooses. What's impossible for man is not impossible for God. And in verse 38, it says that Mary said, I'm the servant. May it be done to me as you have said. And the angel left her. Now, now, how do you think Mary felt after this angelic visit? I'm, I'm sure she was excited. I'm sure she was bursting with joy. I, I, I mean, think about it. She was just visited by an angel. Now, now, that's a supernatural high, no matter what happens to you. But, but it goes further than that. The angel says to her, you're, you're the most favored woman in the world. Out of all the women in the world, God has chosen you. And then you're going to have a baby. And it's going to be great. It'll be called the Son of God, the awaited Messiah. I, I mean, Mary has got to be exuberant at this time. But here's her problem. Who do you share the joy with? I, I mean, who is going to believe this story? William James once said, an impression without an expression leads to depression. An impression without an expression leads to depression. When you've got something exciting going on in your life, but you just can't share it with anybody. You get kind of discouraged. If your child does something great, something significant, they, they score the, the, the most points in the game on Friday night, they get straight A's in school, you want to tell everybody, but, but you especially want somebody to share the joy. So what do you do? You call grandma and grandpa. But who would Mary share her joy with? I wonder if she wanted to run home and tell mom and dad, but, but as she's telling this story, mom, mom and dad are kind of scratching their heads because 
angels just don't appear every day. And, and Mary, come on. I, I mean, if you're in trouble, honey, t tell us, but, but, but be honest. I, I wonder if she thought about telling Joseph, but then thought better of it. Because in verses 39 and 40, it says, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried off to a town in the hill country of Judea. And there she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. Now, now understand, this is no easy trip. From, from Nazareth to where Zechariah and Mary, Elizabeth would have lived at that time was a distance of about 50 miles. Now, now today, that's, that's nothing. We can do that in an hour, but they didn't have cars. They didn't have buses. They didn't have planes. On that day, you walked. And this would have been a four, maybe a five days journey. But she hurried because she wanted to share her joy with someone that she thought would understand. In Luke chapter 1, verses 42 to 45 says, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby jumped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored as to have the mother of my Lord come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary had finally found somebody who understood. So somebody that could rejoice with her. And, and, and she is so excited over what's happening that, that she says a prayer to God that, that, that that's run through the, the ages. Some people call it Mary's song. Others call it the, the Magnificent. But in Luke chapter 2, verses 46 to 49, it says, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And now, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the money one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And, and 2,000 years later, in December, as we go through this Christmas season, we remember Mary. The woman who put herself into God's hands. We remember her not because she, she wanted to be glorified, but because she wanted through her life to glorify God. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 56, it says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned home. Now, she went back to, to Nazareth. She went back to her family and her friends, her, her fiancé. Turn with your Bibles to, to Matthew chapter 1 because uh, I, I want you to see what it would have been like for Mary. In Matthew chapter 1, it says that she went to, to Joseph, the, the man she loves, the man she's going to marry, and, and, and she tells him the story of how this angel appeared to her and how she was going to have a baby, but, but she hadn't really done anything wrong. And, and Joseph at first was, was dreadfully disappointed in Mary. I mean, he believed that she was a moral and righteous woman, and I'm, I'm sure that's one of the reasons that out of all the girls in Na Nazareth, he picked her out to be his wife. But now she comes back, and remember, she's been gone for three months to visit her aunt. And she returns home, and she informs him that she's expecting a, a baby. And he is absolutely devastated. I mean, he, he, he couldn't understand. I, I'm sure this made him sick to his stomach. He, he was speechless. I mean, her story about an angel and a virgin birth. It, it, to Joseph, it probably just made matters worse. I, I, I mean, who's going to believe a story like that? Can Joseph go to his friends and say, guys, Mary's going to have a baby, but it's okay because she didn't do anything wrong. I mean, an angel appeared to her and said that the baby was going to be uh, the son of God. Can you imagine Joseph's friend saying, yeah, Joe, sure. You buy that story? And what if he married her? 
What about his reputation? I mean, can you imagine the wedding day, you know, maybe three, four months later? By now, Mary's obviously showing. and Two ladies sitting in the crowd turned to each other and said, I always thought Joseph was a good boy. Can't believe that he took advantage of Mary before their wedding. So what can we do? I mean, as much as he hated the position he was in, as much as he cared for Mary, he didn't want to marry her. But he didn't want to humiliate her publicly either. In Matthew 1, verse 19, it says, because Joseph, her husband, now, I I want you to understand, sometimes we don't take engagement that seriously, do we? Uh, oh, oh, they broke their engagement. They're, they're, they're not engaged anymore. In, in Joseph's day, there was only one way to break an engagement. Once you made that commitment, you had to go through a divorce. And because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. He, You know, one of the things I think Joseph does right in this story is that he restrains his anger. When you're mistreated by someone, you you instinctively, you want to lash out, you want to get even. Kids aren't coming home for Christmas this year? Well, I'll tell you what, when they call on Christmas Day, we're not going to answer the phone. We'll just act like we're not here. We don't care. Friend lets you down? Well, you sit down and you write him a letter. And you tell him exactly what he did to you and and how it made you feel and all the things you've done for him in the past. You, You tell him how bad he's treated you. You know what? Oftentimes doing the right thing first requires restraining the impulse to do the wrong thing. You hold your tongue. You relax your fists. You you don't blow the horn. You don't mail that angry letter. I I, I love this. A few years ago, I came across this comic at at Christmas time of Calvin and Hobbes. Do you you all know Calvin and Hobbes? The the little tiger and the boy. And Hobbes is the tiger. Calvin's the boy. and, And Calvin sits down to write a letter to Santa Claus. And here's what he wrote. Dear Santa... Every year at this time, I send you a list of what I want for Christmas. And every year, you callously ignore it and bring me practical things I don't want at all. What's the deal? Are you insane? Have you gone see now? Can't you read? Or are you just some addicted, twisted elf bent on spoiling a little kid's dreams? Hobbs looks over his shoulder and says, you know, maybe you want to sleep on that one. <laughs> And Calvin answers, I know, but it felt good to write it. (laughs) You know, sometimes when you're disillusioned with someone, you ask yourself, what's what's the ultimate goal here? Is my goal to hurt them and to get even with them for what they did to me? Or, Or is my goal ultimately maybe... Maybe to bring about some reconciliation and and joy to this relationship again. Restraining our frustrations is is sometimes the most righteous and smartest thing that we can do. And Joseph at least did that, even though he was disillusioned. But I'm sure that, that at this point that Joseph is probably not the only one who's disillusioned. Don't you think? I I mean, don't you think maybe Mary's a little disillusioned too? I I mean, she went to the man she loved, the guy she's going to marry, and she's experienced the the most joyful thing in her life, and she wants to, to, to share the news with him, but he doesn't share her joy. In fact, he doesn't believe her. She probably felt falsely accused. 
I mean, to, to Mary, she was on a spiritual mountaintop. Meanwhile, Joseph's mind was in the gutter. And, and no matter how hard she tried, no matter how much she pleaded, no matter how many tears she shed, he didn't believe it. And he walked away. I'm sure she was devastated. I'm, I'm sure she was disappointed by this lack of trust. And, and some of you here today, uh, I'm sure you've been disillusioned by people that you believed in too. You, you thought your family would never split up, but then mom and dad got divorced. You, you, you found out that mom's drinking again or that the dad's looking for that pornography on the internet. And your son quits attending church. Your, your daughter comes home and tells you she's planning on marrying a non-believer. And you're disappointed with them. Or, or, or maybe you're most disillusioned with God right now. You, you this year had something happen and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed. You never prayed like that before in your life, and yet God didn't answer the prayer the way you wanted him to. I'm sure there are some people in, in western Kentucky right now that are, that are asking God, why did this happen to us? And they're disillusioned. But the angel appears to Joseph and brings reconciliation and joy. Read with me from Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 25. It says, but after he considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit and she'll give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. A virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Now, now, now in the story of Jesus' birth, both from Mary's perspe perspective and, and from Joseph's, I, I think there are three lessons we can learn. That, that in this Christmas season, as joyful as it is, sometimes there's disillusioning circumstances that come along. But, but still we trust in the joy of Christmas. The first is, if you really want joy, put the feelings and needs of others ahead of yourself. Even though Joseph was deeply hurt, he was sensitive to the feelings of Mary. And the first step in restoring a sense of joy to your life is to get, get the focus off yourself. Quit, quit thinking about yourself and think about others instead. If you've been hurt by someone and instead of scheming about ways to get even, you send them a Christmas card. And include a little, little personal note in it. It's, it's amazing how quickly you'll feel better. If you need... Or if you're in need, and, and instead of wishing that somebody else would meet your needs, you, you go out and look for somebody that's needier than you are. And you reach out to minister to them. If you've been neglected by a family member, and instead of wallowing in self-pity and, and, and trying to exclude them this Christmas, you invite them back in and you go out of your way to make them feel more comfortable. Or, or if you're feeling lonely, you find somebody lonelier and go visit them. Because when we put the needs of other people ahead of ourselves, 
Then we experience real joy and real pleasure. That's why psychologist Carl Menninger says the cure for depression is to go across the tracks, find someone else in need, and do what you can to help that person. Go across the tracks, find somebody else, and worry more about them than you do about yourself because sound mental health is contingent upon your willingness to forget about yourself and give to others. So if you want real joy in this Christmas, then learn to consider others more highly than yourself. And secondly, if you want real joy, then seek to have a a genuine encounter with God. Did you notice that after Joseph had this encounter, after, after the angel appeared to him in the dream, everything changed. His attitude His actions, nothing was the same. In Jeremiah 29, 13, God tells us, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, now, now I will let you know this morning that most of the time, God is not going to send an angel, okay? don't, Don't expect that to happen, but but when we minister to others, God can minister to ways to us in ways we never expected at all. But we have to be willing to seek God. To, to put ourselves in a position where we can meet him. That means that we take time to read our Bible. It means we take time to pray. It means that we take time to attend worship services where, where God can speak to our heart and our life. And I've had so many people in my life come to me and say, you know, I can feel just as close to God someplace else. When, when I'm sitting in my tree stand deer hunting, I feel so close to God. Well, don't fall out of the tree stand. When, when I'm out in a golf course in the middle of nature, I feel so close to God. But you know what? Sometimes God only speaks when, when you're open and It's not on the golf course, and it's not in the tree stand. It's with your Bible open, or in church, or visiting with Christian friends. And just as being in church encourages us to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we need to be willing and open to listen to what he says. Have you ever had that happen to you? You're sitting in church, and... And you've had something that's been bothering you all week long. And and suddenly the minister says something and you say, "Ah, how do you know? I've had people that say to me on the way out the door on Sunday morning, have you bugged our house? Maybe, but I'm not going to tell you. (laughs) No. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But it only comes through a genuine encounter with God. In Psalm 73, David writes the first part of the psalm and he's the solution He's depressed, he's down and out. But then in verses 25 to 29, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You you destroy all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it's good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Do you see what's happened? David has changed perspectives. He's changed and taken his eyes off of himself. And he's put him on Jesus. And it's changed his life from... From, from disillusionment to, to, to joy. But what's changed his life? It's his confidence that he's placed in God. He says, God, I know you're always there. And I know you can see me through. 
Now, now thirdly, if you want true joy, then walk in obedience every day. No matter where God may lead. When the angels said to Mary that the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and the power of the Lord's going to overshadow you, so the one born to you will be called the Son of God. She said, may it be done to you, me as you have said. I, I, I don't think that Mary understood exactly what she was saying at that moment to you. I, I, I don't think that she thought, you know, my, my, my fiancé may divorce me and and my friends may turn against me, and my family may not believe me. I don't think she knew that it meant that she was going to have to make a trip to Bethlehem and that the baby was going to be born in a stable. I don't think she knew that she'd have to really relocate to Egypt for two years to protect this baby, and then she was going to have to watch one day as Jesus would be misunderstood and the people who should have listened to him the most would hate him the most and one day he would die a horrible death upon a Roman's cross. She didn't know. But she was willing to obey. When Joseph woke up from the dream, the Bible said he did exactly what the Lord had commanded That, that, that meant going and taking Mary home to be his wife, but, but not, not consummating the marriage until, until after Jesus was born. It, it, it meant raising a son that wasn't really his. And having his whole life disrupted because he, he had to go down to Egypt for two years too, you know, for this boy that wasn't his own. would mean watching people whisper behind his back and point as he and Mary walked by. You know what? The test of real character in nearly every endeavor is the willingness to give a consistent effort every day. I like that. The real test of character in nearly every endeavor is being willing to give a consistent effort every day. Even when it's not very pleasant. Even when nobody's around to notice. Even when it's not that easy. I love the story of Fritz Chrysler. Fritz Chrysler, you've never heard the name, was one of the greatest violinists of all times. His only problem, Bill, you'll understand, he hated to practice. And so he married this woman who was very disciplined. She, she stayed on him every day. She'd say, Fritz, have you practiced yet today? Fritz, when are you going to practice? And, and he could come up with excuse after excuse why not to practice. And then, then there, near the end of his career, they held a banquet in his honor, and world-renowned conductors and musicians stepped to the podium and talked in glowing accolades about his abilities, and, and somebody even stepped up and said, he is the greatest violinist of all time, and hearing all those praises, he, he leaned over and whispered to his wife, have you ever heard such praise? And she leaned over and whispered, just think what they'd say if you had practiced. You know what? If you're a gifted person, it's easy to become satisfied with mediocrity. But if you are, you never feel good about yourself. To, to reach your full potential requires discipline. It, it requires effort every day. And that's when you're most gratified. Uh, I love this quote by Vince Lombardi, a famous coach of the Green Bay Packers. He said, I believe that a man's finest hour 
His greatest fulfillment is the moment when he's worked his heart out in a good cause. He lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. And I think the same is true of the Christian life. You you know what? Lukewarm Christians don't really experience the joy that comes with wholehearted Christianity. That, that, that inner satisfaction, that, that, that joy to the world. It's a lot easier to have that inner satisfaction, though, when, when, when an angel visits you or, 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 or when the crowd notices and everybody pats you on the back. I've told people this before. I, you know, I, I, I hear compliments every Sunday, and I really appreciate it. I had one guy, though, who used to go out of church every week, and he'd say, that was a powerful message, preacher. That was a powerful message. So finally, after a couple of months, I thought, well, what's he talking about? So as he went out the door, I said, what do you mean that's a powerful message? He said, well, some of them's powerful good and others powerful bad. But disillusionment comes when we're not obedient every day, when we're not stretching ourselves to become everything God has called us to be. Jesus said, happy, blessed, joyful are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. He also said, you be faithful unto death, and and I'll give you a crown of life. And, And when you think about that first Christmas, especially that first Christmas night when when Joseph can't find a room. Mary ends up in a stable where she has the baby. I'm sure that things didn't look like they were going very smoothly. But it all turned out okay. Because this reminds us that the joy of a Christian is an inner joy in spite of the circumstances. And and a peace that a Christian experiences in his life is a peace that passes understanding. The angel announced that first Christmas morning, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so I say to you this morning, if you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, it only comes in one way. When you let Jesus come into your heart. Hi, I'm Gary Swick, and I'd like to thank you for listening to the message this morning at Paoli Christian Church. We hope that what you've heard has touched your heart and encouraged you in your walk with God. We would really like to hear from you if you have any spiritual needs that we might help you with. You can contact us by looking for us online at paolichristianchurch.org or by phone at 812-723-2664. Paoli Christian Church is located at 1700 West Hospital Road in Paoli, Indiana. Once more, thank you for listening and I hope that you'll listen again next Sunday as we worship God together at Paoli Christian Church.